The hallucinations come from these uh, blended associations. So anything can be created uh, by the model uh, uh, by prompting it in a certain way. If it, you ask it for very rare things, it's very likely to hallucinate it because the association is weak and it can come up with any kind of association. So to know how this actually works, you have to really look at the way in which these words and text are represented. And they are represented in a very rich and dense multidimensional space. This is a little bit more technical, but not very technical. And the whole idea is inspired on what they call word factors. And a word factor is basically an idea that we do not represent a word literally, but we kind of represent it by a vector, which is basically a list of uh, uh, numbers, um, by looking at which words co-occur with it. So for instance, we can take Wikipedia, and we just get sentences from Wikipedia. And let's say that our target word to represent is a celebrity, actor, uh, moon, and planet. We're just gonna count in all these sentences from Wikipedia, which word occur close by our target word. So we can say, okay, movie occurred 21 times close to a celebrity and Hollywood six times and hero four. A just simple program and just counting, going through all of Wikipedia. We do the same for actor. And you can see that celebrity never occurred with orbit or uh, maybe twice with sun, etc., etc. So basically by counting the context, you build up this kind of a profile in the vector representation that captures how we talk when we mention this particular word, celebrity. And then we can see that we pretty talk in a very similar way about celebrities as we talk about actors, because these counts are very similar. Now, if you look at moon and planet, we see a very different profile. So they're similar, but very different from celebrity and actor. And there is a very simple uh, mathematical formula where you can compare derive the similarity of these two representations, which is called cosine similarity, by taking the dot product for each position here. Eh? A position represents the occurrence of a word, so that's a dimension, as they call it. So there's a one dimension representing movie, another one for Hollywood and hero. You can combine them, and if you add that up, you get a score which tells you how similar these two concepts are on the basis of how we talk about them. If you would simplify that, then you can put that in an n-dimensional space. Well, for us, that's very different, difficult to visualize. So let's take reduce it to a two-dimensional space. That's very easy. We, we characterize words only on the basis of how often they co-occur with movie and orbit. And you just simply count and you would position celebrity over here in the semantic space and actor close by and moon and planet far away. Well, in order to do this properly with what we call a count factor, I simply count these words, you need to be able to, to re represent a lot of different words that can occur in Wikipedia as context words. Uh, so the vector will be very long. And for each word, a very, uh, many of them will have a zero value. So it's not a very efficient way of doing it. Now, word embeddings was the, uh, the trick to turn these very long, sparse count vectors into very dense vectors uh, by training a neural network not to represent the context, but predict the context. Now, how does that work? Well, we just define a very simple neural network where we have only 300 dimensions. Huh? So if I want to do this here on all of Wikipedia, I will have something like maybe 50,000 dimensions. And I have a lot of zeros for each word. In this case, we only have 300. And these 300 are the weights to predict a word that is likely to occur with planet. Now you start in these word embedding something like you take 10,000 words frequently occurring in the English language. That is your lexicon. You take one of them planet, when the model starts, we randomly initialize these weights. Then we look at which words of the remaining 10,000 are actually most similar to my random initialization. In the beginning, all the other words also have random initializations. 
So now we can see how different is orbit Earth and Sun, which are positive examples that occur a lot with planets. How similar or dissimilar are they from the representation of planet? So this is the cosine similarity. If the cosine similarity is high, the representations are good representations. If the cosine similarity is low, they're not good. So we derive a loss to adapt these weights to make planet more similar to the words that it co-occurs with. We do the opposite with other words. It doesn't co-occur with. So we take random words from the vocabulary. So movie, sing, Hollywood. We should change the weights of these words and also for planet to make them dissimilar. Now, if you think and, about... And can you explain why? Uh, because sync has uh, 0 0.45 similar to the, let's say, sun. Uh, is it a mistake or well, something? In the beginning, no? in the, beginning the, the model doesn't know what the correct representation is. Okay. We only tell the model it, a planet does not occur with sync. It does occur with Earth. So that means if it has a similarity, high similarity with sync, and also a similar similarity uh, for sun, it needs to change it to make it more similar to sun and less similar to sink. Okay. Yeah, so it's going to adjust the ways. And you can also see it like uh, if this is one big semantic space, let's say this whole area, and the words mm -hmm. are kind of scattered over this space, it needs to move the words in, in, in uh, using these 300 dimensions closer to each other when they co-occur, a further away if they don't. So it's only adjusting the weights, which means that if I have 300 of those weights, it's not the case that a single weight represents a context word. It doesn't represent anything. Nobody explicitly defined what these weights represent. It's just a way of making co-occurring words more similar and non-co-occurring words less similar. Mm -hmm. So this is how it looks like if you do this on Wikipedia. So a word like planet in a model that has 100 dimensions I would get a representation like this. So this is non, doesn't make any sense to you. Also. Mm -hmm. The only thing that it does is in the learning, it made the, the, the numbers that you get here, these very nuanced, fine-grained, small numbers, similar to the ones from Moon. And if you would uh, visualize this, and this is a nice website where you can f show this, how this works, it will put this into some kind of a, a multi-dimensional space using the 300 dimensions. And you can see here planet and star and sun and universe and galaxy and Jupiter and Earth. They're very close together. So that apparently did a good job. I can also get the list and I can see that after learning, the most similar to planet is now Earth and planets and Mars and orbiting a galaxy. So this is what we want, of course. You can also query a model and get a list of these, and then you get the, the top rank list of most similar things. And there are interesting things like numbers in here, which may represent particular objects in space that got a number, because this is, this is Wikipedia, of course. Some words have multiple meanings, because mm -hmm. we look at planet and moon, and actor and celebrity, but star, could match with both of them. And so the question is, where is star positioned in this uh, semantic space? If you would use a count factor, and we would count how often it would co-occur as movie and orbit, and actually it would position it, if this is a, the data is accordingly, then it would position it exactly in between the two different groups. You can also look at it in this visualization here. So here you can see that star is close to fan and fans and TV and parody. And it's a little bit further away from sun and the plural stars mm -hmm. and Venus and planet. Mm -hmm. and so it's not exactly in the middle of these two, but there's a kind of a preference to, um, to the celebrity uh, meaning of star. And this has become because the Wikipedia data on which this is based is biased towards entertainment information compared to other kinds of information. So this also shows you that in a word embedding, which is the average over all the observed occurrences of the word star, it's kind of a way of empirically driving it from the data that we can find out there, but that data itself has certain biases and doesn't represent all possible 
uh, interpretations that we can have. So this is where the bias starts, the bias that we often discuss there about are, the data set. Yeah, the, all the biases are derived from the, the data that we use for training. Now here it needs to stick to a compromise. It cannot either choose between one or the other. Now the, the large language models that we now have today actually solve this problem. And so we have the models like Google Bird, but also ChatGPT, they use the same principle. And that is they do not just represent the word as the average over all the occurrences, they, they represent the word in the actual sentence in which you present the word. And that means that uh, initially it may say, okay, star will have this kind of compromised meaning uh, but I'm going to adjust the meaning using the attention of other words in the context. So mask here would be a word that in this large language model, star needs to predict, uh, just as it was predicting with word embedding. But now it gets help from another word like bright. And then uh, it should predict planets and comets. But then in this sentence, star needs to predict this word, which is a uh, movie, and it gets help from Hollywood. So the attention, this is the, the famous paper, attention is all you need. The attention of the words in the sentence help re a moving star from, let's say, a wrong or compromised position in the space to the right position. This is a kind of a schematic representation of a transformer, which is basically the Google software package in which these large language models are built. So in a transformer system, you would have a vocabulary that was learned from looking at a lot of text and all kinds of words in there, and sometimes parts of words, if it has a hash like this one. And if you use a model, it would just check a word and then look up the corresponding word embedding. So in the case of uh, a word like star, at the beginning, it would initialize uh, this word in a sentence by using this average representation, the word embedding. And that would be something that looks like the, here at the top of the slide, a, a, a vector with these very fine-grained, dense, numbers. In this case, with the contextual models, they're a little bit bigger than word embeddings. We're not talking about 300, but for instance, for birds, 768. And for chat GPT, we're talking about thousands of these. Now, if you would take a sentence like a good movie needs a Hollywood star, it will build up a representation for star going through several layers, uh, 12, 24, sometimes a bigger model, 40 layers. And in each layer, it's going to change the representation by predicting a word in that sentence and getting help from the other words. So a star is the, is the key, is the initialization. It will get help from the blue one, which is uh, 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 the query or the attention in order to produce a derived factor. And that factor representation if you would go back to the vocabulary and look what is the most likely word, it should give you movie. If it does this successfully, we have a good representation. And this kind of operation in adjusting the representation of initial star on the basis of the sentence will happen several times with 24 or more layers. And in the end, at the top, I will get the resulting representation for star, which is the adapted representation. So it's a very simple operation. Of course, the mathematical nuances are a little bit more complicated, but the basis is I look up the word star in the vocabulary. I find the word embedding. This is the initial one. But I'll also look up the representation of Hollywood. I combine the two and I get a combined representation, which is uh, this one. Then this was the masked position in the sentence. I check the vocabulary, which word embedding is most similar to the one I generated. If this is correct, I did something right. If it is wrong, I did something bad. So I adjust the weights of star in order to make the correct prediction. If I would take another sentence, like a blue planet runs a bright star, we start exactly in the same way. We look up star, we initialize the representation of star, 
we get help now from right and we derive a representation for this position here and then that should predict the word planet so basically the initialization is the same for star we have different attention we produce a different vector and that should link to a different word now in the case of chat gpt what OpenAI did is they built uh, such a large language model from a lot of data that was collected from the web. Like Common Crawl has uh, in, uh, uh, since 2008 collected 20 terabyte of text for a lot of different languages every month. And they have 10 to the 15 petabytes of data. There is web text where data has been cleaned. There's Wikipedia, Google Books, and all of this is unfiltered. They just grab whatever they could get. Using this data, they built a GPT-3, 5, or now it's 4, and we have more recent models recently. But basically, they're all trained in the same way as I described. They know exactly how to represent a word in the context of a sentence, and these models are trained to predict other words with each other, uh, together. So you can give it any kind of sequence in this case, and it will predict the next one. The difference between a generative model like GPT and a BERT model is that BERT will predict words to the left and to the right and gets help from words to the left and to the right. A generative model can only produce the next item in a sequence.